Happy New Year. Here we are. It's 2024, day one, ground zero. And welcome back, by the way. If you've been listening to the pod for a long time or you're brand new, I'm so grateful. I'm so honored that you're here. And today I actually mixed up the schedule of the episode releases because I was like, you know what? I need to bring somebody on to help me start the new year feeling motivated, feeling clear, feeling clarity. And also, I feel like the community needs that. It's so helpful to start the new year feeling grounded, feeling like we have an idea, we have a focus of where we're headed. And so naturally, I was like, okay, who do I bring on the podcast? I need somebody who's wise, somebody who had experienced their work, and somebody within the Latina network, because we're still in season two in our collaboration with Latinas Who Meditate. And long story short, I was within the Amigo hood of We All Grow, I stumbled upon this woman's group coaching class and I was just taken back. And of course, as the universe would have it, synchronicity, literally last night, she had reshared one of my videos about cacao because she herself is from Guatemala, which is where I source a lot of my cacao, a lot of my cacao training comes from. And it dawned on me, I was like, oh my gosh, it's her. That's who I need to have on the podcast. I was like, let me message her and see if by the grace of God, she might have a sliver of time because this mujer is also busy. She is successful. She helps so many ambitious women. I was like, let me just put it out there. And sure enough, she replied and she was like, yes, I would love to do this. So here we are today. I'm sitting down with Wendy Amara, who is a successful, Latina life and business coach with over 16 years of experience and she specializes in coaching ambitious Latinas, ambitious women who want to reach big life, career, and business goals. And so what better way to start the new year than with Wendy. Wendy, thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Natalie. I'm so excited to be here with you and with all of your listeners. Thank you for allowing me to come into your community and share my gifts, my medicine, especially for the new year. Absolutely. I think the new year can feel daunting because there are so many different ways to approach intention setting, goal setting, and just having some support, having a rubric that we can pick from and see what feels right, what doesn't is really helpful. And so I'm so grateful to have you sharing your wisdom. And before we dive into all the goods, I just want to lay the groundwork, paint the picture, because we are neighbors. I'm from El Salvador and you're from Guatemala. And I would love to hear about your upbringing, what that was like. I know that you are a child of immigrants, which as am I. And I think it's so beautiful to see you stepping into your power and helping other women step into their power coming from that background. So share with us about your background, your heritage, where you grew up, and a little bit about your journey of how you ended up doing what you do today. Thank you for that, Natalie. That's so awesome. Yes, my Central American sister. Yes, we need to support each other as much as possible. Yes, so I am fortunate enough to have grown up with parents from Guatemala. They came here during the late 1970s. I was actually born in LA. I was technically born in Glendale. So yeah, I wasn't born in Guatemala. But we spent summers in Guatemala a lot, like when I was a kid, right? Because we went to go see my abuelita every summer. So I would spend a month from the time I was two until the time I was like 11 or 12 every summer in Guatemala, in different parts of Guatemala. We spent time in Antigua. We spent time in Quetzaltenango. I've spent time in the capital, of course, because majority of my family lives in the capital. But we also got to travel, right? I've been to Tikal. I had this amazing spiritual experience in Tikal and with all the ruins and also traveled to Honduras, Belize. I've been to this great town called Livingston, which is basically like the Guatemalan version of Jamaica. It's literally like Rastafanians with dreads, but speaking Spanish and they're Guatemalan. They're like, I'm from Guatemala. And I'm like, wait, you look like you belong in Jamaica. And they're right on the coast, right? It's this beautiful place called Livingston. Most people don't even know it exists in Guatemala. Anyways, my dad has always been super proud of being from Guatemala and super proud of our indigenous roots, right? He always told me from the time I was a little girl that I come from these great people called the Mayans. And he would start telling me stories about the Mayans. And he was always about honoring both, not just our Spanish or European blood, but also honoring our Guatemalan blood. And he was also really proud of being from Guatemala the whole time he was here in the United States, right? So it wasn't about, 
I'm coming here to the U.S. to live a better life. He was like, no, Guatemala is the better life. I'm coming here because there's some political stuff happening in our country that is challenging at this time. But the U.S. also has a lot to do with why that's happening in Guatemala. So one of the stories that he shared with me that impacted me so much, and I like to say that my dad brainwashed me into this level of confidence, but I think I was like seven or eight years old. I was a little kid, right? And so he tells me this story of the Mayans. He's like, do you know that your ancestors, the Mayans, invented math? They invented the number zero before people understood the concept of nothing. They gave it an actual number. And he said to me, you know, that same genius blood is in you too, Wendy. So your ancestors are inventing math. What are you going to do with your life? And I was like, um, like your mouth just drops, right? It's kind of like finding out that you're like related to kings and queens. And, and you're like, what are you going to do? So he set the bar really high for me. He was like, you come from these geniuses. You can do anything you want. And also a little bit of like, you come from these geniuses. You have a responsibility <laughs> to do something with this genius blood that's in your body and your brain. You have a responsibility to do something with this life. So I've always been super proud to be from Guatemala. I walk into every room and I say, my family's from Guatemala. We're in Central America. I think part of my mission is educating people about that bringing our culture to light, tying in things back to our culture. And my confidence comes 100% from my dad, who's super proud to be chepping. <laughs> that is so epic, Wendy. Wow. I didn't know that the Mayans were some of the first to give a word, a name to zero, to nothingness. And you know what? It's so beautiful because, like I said, we're neighbors, right? El Salvador, Guatemala, they might as well be the same country because they're so close to each other and they're so small. When we share so many of the same roots and it's so funny because growing up, math was always my favorite subject. Like I was always so good at math and I was like, I am not very good at many other subjects, but math, I got it. And maybe that's why. That's wild. Yeah. Because of Mayan. Wow. And I want to take a pin off of a mental note that I made of something that you said, if you had a really spiritual experience in Tikal with the ruins, if for the listeners who aren't familiar with Tikal, tell us about that geographic location. I know you're not a historian, but whatever degree of history that, that you want to share. And what was your experience there? I'm so curious. Yes. So in my 20s, I think I was actually 20, I went back to Tikal. I went when I was a child and I remember these huge ruins, right? So Tikal is one of the largest Mayan ruins of a city. It was a thriving city during the height of the Mayan culture. And it was a city in which there were lots of different communities. There were temples, there were games that were played. It was just this thriving metropolis of a city. And there's these temples now that you can actually climb and you can go all the way to the top, right? These different temples that have huge steps. I remember when I was a child, the steps are like the same size as a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old child. They're huge. Like we think of regular steps like stairs when we think of stairs in the U.S. No, this is probably four or five times the size of a typical stair. You really have to put your leg way up to climb this mountain or to climb the ruins. So when I went back in my 20s with my mom, we decided to climb one of these pyramids all the way to the top, which is exercise. It does require like breathing in and breathing out. When I got all the way to the top, I had an experience where there was a little room that had not a door, but a doorway that was open. So it wasn't a room that you picture has four walls. It was a room that had three walls and then an opening, a small room. And I decided to go in. And as I went in, first of all, I noticed that the top was right above my head. Like I didn't have to duck down, but I was the exact right height for this room, which doesn't happen to me normally because I'm short. I'm 5'1", barely. So normally... <laughs> I'm way shorter than any room, right? Ever. Like I'm always like smaller than any room I have to walk into. And this felt, the first thing I noticed was it felt the right exact size for me. Like it felt like the room was created for my height, which was so beautiful. I was like, yes. Oh, this is beautiful. So I walk in 
And then I got this tremendous amount of energy. Woo! Like a heat and a light. And it felt like thousands of people, thousands of spirits, thousands of souls all around me, all around me. Like all of a sudden I was surrounded by this light that felt like lines and lines, like a lineage, right? Almost like you see when you walk, one of those circles that you have to, like when you walk a labyrinth, right? Like that, but it was people. It was like spirits, souls that were the labyrinth all around me. So powerful. It was so powerful that I physically started to shake. And then I took a step back because I was like, whoa, whoa, what was that? Like I just entered some sort of, I don't know, vortex, something. So I took a big step out of the room and then I took a deep breath and I was like, did that just happen? I don't even know what that is. Something just happened to me. And my mom was like in another place. So she wasn't around me for me to look at her and and have the experience with her. Like I couldn't share it with her because I remember thinking, where's my mom? Maybe I should tell her. Maybe she should come into this room and see what happens. So then I took a deep breath in and I went in again slowly, this time with more awareness, right? Of like, I'm going into this room at the temple. This is at the top of the biggest temple in Tikal. I don't remember the name of the temple, but this is literally the top of the biggest temple. It was so powerful. I walked back in and this time, same feeling, but it was a little lighter, like a little more filled with love, a little more. It felt less intense the second time I walked in. It felt softer. That was the feeling, softer. But like you're standing in the middle of the labyrinth full and it's people instead of it being like rocks or something that leads the way. It's ancestors, it's energy, it's human spirit. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. That is powerful and not surprising because Tikal, if I'm not mistaken, was the capital of the Mayan culture. So a lot happened there. I mean... It was literally the Mayan capital, and it's like deep in the Guatemalan rainforest. It's one of the largest archaeological sites in Mesoamerica, what we consider Central America. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yes, it's thank in you the for middle, sharing It that. is in the middle of the jungles and hard to get to. It can be a challenge to get there. It's not something that you can just take a flight in and you're, <laughs> you're there. It's some hiking. It's a challenge to get to there. But you're absolutely right. It is the capital of the Mayan culture. It's also, by the way, in Star Wars, the movie. So this is one of the things that my dad would always point out. I'm telling you, my dad was always like looking for opportunities to educate us about Guatemala or to bring it to the forefront. And so I remember being a kid watching Star Wars in Return of the Jedi. I think they go to one of the lands. And for two seconds in Return of the Jedi, you see the top of the pyramid. Actually, the top of the pyramid that I had this experience in from Tikal. And my dad in the middle of the movie, right? I remember being like seven years old or whatever. He's like, there's Tikal. See, it's even in Star Wars. See, even Star Wars is is talking about Guatemala. And he points it out. Yeah. By the way, I might be getting the movie wrong, so I apologize, especially to my husband, who's a huge Star Wars fan, (laughs) that I have to look back which movie is Tikal, that Tikal comes in. But it's in one of the first three, one of the original Star Wars films. That is so wild. I love that you had that experience of the presence of the ancestors and that they also made themselves known to you, right? Because it's not everyone that has these connections with call it different dimensions with spirits with ancestors it's like you have to be ready and it's almost like an initiation in itself and talking about initiations I read a little bit about your background and you have built a massively successful coaching practice even through being diagnosed with bipolar and ADHD in your 20s First of all, I just want to say congratulations because it's such a testament to the power of doing the work, to the power of mindset, to the power of resilience and believing in yourself, regardless of what the outside world tells you. And I would love to talk about, I know that you do a lot of work within the realm of what you call being work. And I'm so curious, what does being work mean? Capital B-E-I-N-G work. Yes. Thank you so much for asking me that because I that one of my missions in the world is to 
have more people realize what is being work. Yeah. Being work is the real work. <laughs> it's the internal work. I define it as three different aspects to your life. Being work is working on your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your intentions, and your energy. Your energy or the frequency at which you're vibrating at, right? That fifth one is kind of that energetic level, frequency level. Being is what people feel when you walk into a room. Sometimes before you even said anything, they just feel an energy that comes from you. And they're feeling literally your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your intentions, and the frequency at which you're vibrating at. That's what people are feeling when you walk into a room. So being, it's hard to describe it because it's not something that we can put necessarily our finger on. One of the most powerful tools that I was taught when I first started doing transformational work, and I discovered coaching and transformational work because of what you just shared. I was diagnosed in my 20s with bipolar at one point, severe depression, severe anxiety issues, and then also ADHD. And all of that caused me to feel this overwhelm of, oh my gosh, how am I going to manage my life? And I had also done everything that my immigrant parents told me to do. I had gone to school and gotten a good job and gone to grad school and had followed the plan. And I still found myself unhappy. Like I wasn't feeling fulfilled by all those things. And even days where I was like, oh, this is good. I have this job. I have this steady income. There was always something in me that was saying, no, there's more. There's more to this life than just this job and this stability coming into your life, Wendy. There's something else that you need to look for. And so after a huge breakup with one of my ex 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 boyfriends, <laughs> I fell into a depression and somebody said, you should go to this training. And I discovered self-development, personal development work that I hadn't had access to before that. Once I discovered these tools, I was like, oh, I started to use them in my life. And so being work comes from one of these tools. This is a tool that I teach my clients now. It's called be, do, have. Now, be, do, have is a perspective. It's a way to live your life. And it's actually what most leaders, CEOs use in their life to manage. Yes. Be, do, have says that everything starts with who you're being first with your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your intentions, your frequency. And then you take action from that place. And action is like the strategies, the sending of the emails, the getting on the calls, the all of that, right? The speaking engagements, whatever the strategy is. Then you take action. And then you're going to have the result. The having is the result, right? And really what you want is the result. Most people go almost immediately to action strategy when they're thinking about a result. If they're like, oh, you know, in 2024, I want to make this much amount of money, or I want to double my income, or I want to get a promotion, or I want to buy a new house. The human brain will almost always go to how. How do we do that? What's the strategy? What are the three steps I need to take, right? How do I save up this amount of money? Or what are the conversations I need to have? So it almost always goes to the action step. Be, do, have says, no, 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 hold on. Before we go to the action step, who do you need to be to make that goal happen? So let's say I have a goal to double my income next year. Who do I need to be to double my income? And when I ask myself that question, who do I need to be, what starts opening up are things like, who I'm going to have to be courageous. I'm probably going to need to be decisive. Like I'm going to need to make some decisions, right? And that requires being decisive. And I might need to be confident, confident in those decisions <laughs> that I just made. So probably I'm going to need to be in terms of the energy that I'm connected to, the thoughts that I'm thinking, the feelings I'm feeling, right? I'm probably going to need to be courageous, decisive, confident. And here's the beauty of be, do, have and the beauty of being work and why I think it's so amazing and powerful for human beings, especially for Latinas, is that I can be those things right now. You can be those things right now. If you're listening to this podcast, you can tap into that way of being now. You can find the courageous version of you. Trust me when I say she's alive in you right now. 
there was a time probably in the last couple of years where you had to take courageous action, where you had to tap into courage. So she's in you. There's also a decisive version of you that has made decisions in your life, probably tough decisions at some time. She's in you too. And then there's a confident version of you, your way of being. So tapping into those ways of being, tapping into courageous, confident, decisive Wendy right now, that's where the magic is. Because then once I'm tapped into her, then I can ask her, okay, what are the action steps that I have to take? (laughs) And even the action step of like, well, I've got to save a certain amount of money if my goal is to buy a house, let's say. Then we can save that money from this place of courage, confidence, and decisiveness, right? From being connected to that being work. And it's not to say that the doing isn't important because the doing is, I mean, one of my programs is called Inspired Action because it is important to take action. You do have to take action. It's not enough to just meditate or sit and think about or visualize something. But this being part, this one, most of us skip especially in this American culture of do, 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 have, have, have. There's no be, 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 human being, just be. Let's focus on that. So that is what being work is. That's what I teach my clients is how to focus on who you're being first and then taking action from that place. And then, of course, having the result. (laughs) It's so dang good, Wendy. Be, do, have. It's so true when we think about in the perspective of new year, whether you call it setting intentions, setting goals, it's like we think about the do. Save X amount of money, spend X amount of time with my loved one, get a promotion or whatever it might be. We go into the doing, but the being part is even more important. I I saw on Instagram, oh my God, I'm forgetting his name. He's fabulous. And he posts the most hilarious reels on like spirituality and the universe and manifestation. And the most recent one that he posted, the basis of it was, it's not fake it till you make it. It's embody it till you become it. And it's that being part, right? We're not faking it. Like you said, we're tapping into something that's innately within us. Maybe we're not so familiar with it. For me, I like to think about archetype work? Like what archetype am I most comfortable in? What archetype do I live out most of my life? But it's not to say that all the other archetypes don't reside within me or I haven't experienced them in the past. It's just not the muscle that I'm most used to flexing. But just remembering that it's already within us and having that piece of, okay, when have I been courageous? When have I been decisive? And so when you think about be, do, have, you know, people listening, they're like, okay, I'll focus on the being. What are some practical ways that people can consider the being part before they jump into the do, before they jump into the goal setting? Do you have any advice on how people can consider what they want to be, whether it's value-based or archetype-based? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think asking yourself powerful questions that bring up who you need to be in a particular situation, that's the best way to start connecting to being work, right? So for example, I have my clients look at past successes. So one of the things we do for 2023 is look at what were my wins in 2023? What did I actually achieve, right? And for this year, for many of them, especially in business and entrepreneurship, right, there's been a lot of challenges. And so really shifting the brain into, no, but there were some wins. There were some things that went well (laughs) or that continue to go well, right? I even did a podcast on this because it's hard for our brain to go to what did work. So focusing on that, one really powerful question you can ask yourself to tap into being work is, who was I being when I made that happen? Who was I being when I made the XYZ goal happen or when I created the business or when I was able to launch the product or whatever the goal is, right? Or when I actually improved my health. What way of being supported me in reaching that goal? Who was the version of me that made that happen? And then feelings start to come up. And sometimes taglines like, well, I just did it. I was in action. Okay, what version of you is that version of you that doesn't overthink things but just moves into action? And sometimes we start to get ideas around like, oh, I was being fearless or I was being really connected to that version of me, or I was being really connected to my purpose or my mission, or I was feeling inspired. 
all of that starts to open up. So looking at your wins, in fact, a great exercise to do that I think is really anchored in reality is look at your last five wins, five successes. And by a win, I don't mean like it doesn't have to be anything huge. I don't mean like you got your master's degree or you got your PhD. It doesn't have to be that big of a deal. It can just be like my kids did well in school this year. Perfect. Yay. <laughs> Nobody got an F on any report cards. Okay. And that's just one way to measure or everybody felt loved or Christmas was a good holiday this year. Like there were no fights over politics at Christmas. That could be a win. It doesn't have to be anything really super big, right? Look at the win. And then who was I being that created that? And asking yourself that. Go through each of these five successes and pull out that way of being. Because sometimes it works looking at the past to really pull out like, okay, what did I do? Who was I being? And the brain will want to go to do. Even right now, my brain was like, what did I do that created that win? Yeah. And so then you've got to, you can go to do, that's okay. And then you've got to retract a little bit and go behind it and ask, but who was I being when I did that? And most of the time, what opens up for you is like, I was being loving. I was being compassionate. Sometimes it is I was being decisive and I was being aggressive and that worked. Great. Whatever it is that worked for you. Now you're starting to tap into who am I being? And then what starts to happen is we can start to look at the future. Okay, if I want to make this goal happen, who do I need to be to reach that goal? And one of the ways that I like to use it with clients is to anchor it into today. Like, who do you get to be today? Which is also another way to ask, what is my intention for today? Who do I need to be today on the calls that I have on my calendar today? Or the time that I'm going to spend with my family today? What version of Wendy needs to be on the forefront, right? Do I need to be loving Wendy? Do I need to be coach Wendy? Because I have this way of being as a coach. <laughs> so tapping into that. And the more connected you are, the more you start being able to access all these different ways of being, which is the beginning of reaching an equal. That's it. Oh, so juicy, so good. And so asking powerful questions about who you were in a past scenario where you felt like that was a win. And a win can look however it needs to look for you. It can be, damn, you got your master's. Heck yeah. It can also be, dang, all my children got good grades this year. Great. And so connecting with the past version of you, bringing that into the now. So we've talked about the past and the present. I want to ask about the final piece within this trifecta of past, present, and future, because I know that you also do a lot of work connecting to your future self. So for those that maybe are not familiar with the term future self, you can kind of begin to, through context clues, dissect what that means. I would love to hear from you what future self connection and work looks like for you and your clients and how somebody can begin to dabble in that realm. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you so much because we've, we're actually preparing for the next future self experience. I do a training where you actually connect with the future version of you. Yeah. So I've been a coach for many years, right? I've been coaching for 16 years. I just shifted into coaching Latinas specifically in 2019. So before that I was a general life coach and business coach, and I would coach on everything. In fact, I've had different specializations, ADHD coaching. So I have a specialization in that sales coaching and enrollment coaching. I have a specialization in that. So these are particulars that I specialize in the world of coaching, but Latina specifically with an intention as a niche, I've been coaching for about four years, this iteration of me, right? I call it this iteration of, of the business. And part of what I wanted to start bringing into this realm was manifestation work, which I used to practice like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. In fact, there's this beautiful story of how I manifested the twins. I have twins named Luca and Leia after Star Wars. <laughs> and there's a story of how I manifested them. I totally created it out of nothing and internal work with the help of Deepak Chopra and Reverend Michael Beckwith. Literally both helped me in, um, uh, containers with them. I was at it. Anyways, go listen to the podcast. There's this great story that I talk about with the retreat that I did with Deepak, with my husband, and a actual process that Reverend Michael Beckwith did on my body that produced the twins. So I believe in manifestation work 100%. I don't call myself a manifestation coach, but I think that is part of the toolbox in the coaching world that we can use to support ourselves, right? And part of the 
tools in the manifestation toolbox that I love and that I use continuously is future self. It's connecting with the future version of you. So a truth that I hold on to is that the future version of you is alive in you right now. Like she's alive in you, right? The future version of me, the five year from now version of me or the 50 year old Wendy or 60 year old Wendy is alive in me right now. I'm creating her through my thoughts, through my beliefs, through my decisions, through the actions I take or don't take, right? We're in a dance together. Just like there's a seven-year-old version of me, there's this future version of me. Yeah. And she's the version of me that's done a bunch of stuff that I want to do, right? She's completed the goals or reached the goals. There's even a version of you that's at the end of 2024, right? December 2024 version of you that has completed the year. And there's so much that opens up for us when we tap into her, when we can actually connect with her, because she has insight into how this year went for you, (laughs) what helped, what didn't. Now, it's a little tricky because people are like, are you literally just asking her how she created the year? It's already done. And you're just like moving the veil and looking at what's already done. And I like to look at it like it's more of a dance. We're co-creating, right? It's me now and the future version of me. We're co-creating. And in this dance, I get to communicate with her. And so that is what future self work is. It's tapping into that future version of you, connecting with her so that you get insight, questions answered, messages, information that will support you through this year in taking action and actually moving towards creating your goals. It's so powerful because if we think about it, within the quantum field, all timelines exist in this now moment. We're just, the the radio frequency that we're tuned into is this timeline, this one right here. And so from that perspective, we have access to all information everywhere, all the time, which is super meta and it's super hard for the human brain to grasp. So if you're listening and you're like, what are you saying, Natalie? Don't worry about it. Because this is called practical alchemy, right? The alchemy is the magical, the practical is the 3D. What are some practical ways? And I know that you said that you have a whole course and session coming up on this. So if anybody listening is curious about it, we'll link all of Wendy's information in the show notes. Go check it out, dive deeper. But for somebody listening, what are some of the practical ways that people can connect to their future self? Is it through meditation, through writing? What what have been some of the ways that you've seen be access points for people to have that conversation, have that dance with their future self? Yeah, I'd love to share three practical ways. First is visualization practices, right? So you can actually close your eyes right now and think about December 2024. I'm sorry. Yes, 2024, the next year that we're moving into. And picture, what do I want to be feeling that day? What's the main energy I want to be in? What's the main thought I want to be thinking that day? And just closing your eyes and being still and thinking about a future date, what tends to happen is an opening of visualizations for us. We start to see things that come to us. I do an actual led visualization process where I lead people through a process during the future self-experience, which is an actual in-person training. But you could do this on your own where you actually sit and pick a date in the future and start to visualize what do I want to create? What do I want to call in, right? And for example, people that are calling in like relationships, you can start to picture who am I in a relationship with? What does that look like? What do I feel? And then you want to anchor it into your senses. What am I touching? What am I feeling? What am I seeing, right? So visualization practices are really powerful. This is also true with anything that you want to call into the future. So you can use a date and you can also use a a goal that you have for the future. Like if you want to make a certain amount of money, a great visualization for that is closing your eyes and picturing your bank account with that number in the bank account, right? Like picture the actual screen when you check your bank account or on your phone when you use the app to check your bank account. And the actual like logo of your bank and the whole shebang and the number that you want to visualize being in the account that opens up more possibility. So visualization. Second one is scripting, right? Scripting is a great manifestation tool. 
And a great way to script by connecting with your future self is picking a date in the future that you then script backwards as if it happened yesterday, right? So we can even pick March of 2025. It's March 15th, 2025. And you're going to script a day in your life. I woke up and I felt the silk sheets underneath my body. (laughs) And I smelled the ocean breeze outside my door because, of course, in 2025, I live by the ocean. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, you could script anything, right? And you start to write out a day in your life from the perspective of it happened yesterday. And then I got up and then I smelled the coffee that my husband was pouring into my favorite cup. And then my three children came into the room and jumped on the bed with me. And you can go through the whole day exactly what you want to feel, what you smell, what you're touching. You want to use the senses. I see, I smell, I feel, I touch, I hear the noises that you hear. You want to use all the senses to bring that forward. Scripting is really powerful. It's like journaling into the future, right? It's a different way to kind of journal into the future. Yeah. And then lastly, and this is an exercise we actually do also in the future self experience, a powerful exercise to embody your future self, right? Is to sit and actually start connecting with that future version of you. So think of your life. Let's just go to March of 2026. That's three years from now or two years from now. March of 2026. Who's in my life? Where am I living? What's around me? Where am I working? Or what's my business look like? What have I created? What's the physical space look like? What's the furniture look like? What all of that, right? And start connecting to that. And then here's the powerful part. Then ask someone to interview you. So you ask someone to come in and talk to 2026 version of you, right? So they're going to ask you questions like, tell me what's worked to get your life to where you're at. Tell me what makes you the most happiest now. Tell me what you're concerned with. Tell me what energizes you. Like these are all great interview questions for your future self. And if you do it with another person, it feels different than you trying to interview yourself (laughs) because it feels like you're stepping into the embodiment of that future version of you and they're pulling out these answers, right? And Sometimes it's uncomfortable. This is a part of why I created the training because people needed a container like to really practice this because your human brain wants to go to now and answer from now. And I keep reminding people, no, 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 this is the future version of you. This is the person who's already written the book, already launched the podcast, already made the money, already living in the dream house or whatever. So from her perspective, how did she write the book? Those are the questions you want to ask. Yeah. So those are three ways, right? They're kind of anchored into reality, using visualization to connect with your future self, scripting or writing out a day in your life in the future as if it was yesterday, and then getting interviewed, embodying that future version of you, and then somebody interviewing (laughs) that version of you to pull out answers. I think all of that is powerful ways to connect. Powerful indeed. I mean, my gosh, I feel like I need to join your future self workshop because It's so much more powerful too when you do it with a container, when you have people who are in the arena with you, holding you accountable, which kind of leads me to my next and final question, because honestly, Wendy, I could talk to you all day. You are such a beacon of wisdom and knowledge. And so, yes, we've got all the pieces. We're excited. We're motivated. Year is beginning. We've done the exercises. We have clarity. And now we're three months in and we're feeling a little lazy and follow through is becoming a little harder and consistent action is not as consistent. So what would you say to somebody who's at that phase to keep going? Go back to your mission or vision. Or for some of us, it's the thing we're passionate about or the thing we love unconditionally. Because motivation is going to come and go. You're not going to be motivated forever. I love what I do. And I tell people all the time, I'm not motivated every day to coach. And I love it with a passion. But what I am every day is connected to the vision and the passion and the love that I have for what I do. So what doesn't go away is the love that you honestly have for the thing that you're trying to create or the thing that maybe is already in your life. For many of us, this is our family. 
that doesn't go away, right? The passion and love we have for our why, our vision, our mission in life, that calling. For some of us, it's like a whisper that just never goes away and then continues to get louder and louder and louder. Mm -hmm. If that's you, yes, you get to come to the future self experience so we can start to expand on that. Um, that doesn't go away. But motivation as a human being and the human experience that you're having, that's going to have a lot of ups and downs because life is the ups and downs. So you're not always going to feel consistent or feel like you can get yourself up and practice the work. The practice is so important. So here's what I tell people. Connect with your why. Connect with the passion behind the thing that you love. And connect with that love, right? And then get yourself into a container that holds you, that has accountability and some structure for you to actually keep yourself moving. Because the key is to not quit. That's it. The key is to not quit. Keep going. Three things that will guarantee you reach any goal. One, manage your mind or practice a being work, right? Being work. Take consistent action. Stay in action. Keep moving yourself forward. And then lastly, don't quit until you get there. That's it. You don't quit. You're allowed to take breaks. You can take breaks for sure. <laughs> but don't quit. Don't stop. Keep yourself going. This is actually why my group coaching container, it's called Inspired Action, is a year-long commitment. It's a year-long commitment because it's a lot to stay committed to one thing for a year, especially when you want to quit like a hundred different times. And everybody does. I tell everybody when they come in, you're going to want to quit. And they're like, no, I love you. I love the work, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, 50% of the group at some point wants to quit because life will happen. There will be the ups and the downs of life. So part of what we're learning is how do you stay committed to something through the ups and downs of life? Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. And I know that we've mentioned it a couple of times, but for those who want to connect with you, who want to dive deeper with your work, what's the best way for people to find you? What's the best way for people to connect with you? And anything that you want to share coming up, seeing as it's January 1st of 2024? Yes. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for having me. I have a group coaching program called Inspired Action, which is a great place to start practicing being work. And we also do a lot of accountability around follow through and consistency and action. Yeah. So if you want to find out more about that, you're welcome to DM me on Instagram. That's where I'm most active at. If you follow me at Wendy Amara, you can send me a DM for more information and me or someone on my team will send you information for inspired action. I do Wednesdays with Wendy, which is an IG live I do every Wednesday. You can submit questions for that. I also have a podcast called Yes Mujer Build It. And that podcast, you can submit questions for that too. And I do like a live Q&A. It's not live recorded Q&A for the podcast. And if you want to email me, you can email me at hello at wendyamara.com. You can email questions for coaching that you want to submit for the podcast. Or if you have any questions about any offerings or want to connect with me, email me to hello at wendyamara.com. Yes. And we'll link all of this in the show notes. So be sure to check those out. Wendy, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. I appreciate your time, your wisdom, and just thank you for being you and all that you do in the world. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for jumping, following your instinct, which is what you did yesterday. You followed your intuition and you're like, I'm just going to do it. And the best things come out of following that instinct and the intuition. And I think sometimes when things aren't planned, that's when like the beauty of life just opens itself up. So thank you for who you are and for the work you continue to do for the community. Thank oh. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those listening, if you enjoyed the show, if you enjoyed the episode, be sure to like, rate, review, share with a friend, subscribe, and let us know how you try on these tools for size, how it goes. Send us a message and we'll see you next time.